I, uh, I, I, I am so happy that I got to walk out to that great new British band, One Direction. I don't know if any of you uh, <laughs> get tween music humor. Anyway, uh, I'm Michael Bracey. I'm one of the co-founders of Future Music Coalition, and it is my immense honor to welcome all of you uh, and those watching live online to our 12th Future of Music Summit here at Georgetown University. Uh, we're, we're 13 years old, 12th Summit, yeah. The, um, which means that this is the final year between the summit is actually a tween. So we're right at that kind of difficult stage between, uh, you know, still being <clears throat> under tween age. But, um, but we are going to be tweening out a little bit this week, and it's going to be a, 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 we hope, a lovely event. Um, we really spent a lot of time this year um, thinking about why do we do the summit, why do you, you people come to the summit, why do people watch the summit, and we really were, were, we thought a lot about um, some basic issues, in, in, including the idea of community and the idea of why people come to this event, why uh, hopefully what people get out of this event. And some of it is what happens here on stage, but really a lot more about it is the conversations that happen uh, out here in the audience and, and on campus over the next couple of days and virtually via Twitter and, and via the net and the webs. And what we're really you know, trying to focus on again is the idea that there's so many complex, difficult issues that face the music community and face musicians that nobody has all the answers. And this has always been the underpinning of this conference, that there are lots of people with lots of different perspectives and lots of information and lots of vision and lots of ideas. And if we can try to create a community and a sense of people working together to try to put together these pieces, then we're doing something that's productive and a good use of time. And so what we've done this year with the summit is we've tried to build in more space. You know, the agenda is always packed. There's a lot of great panels. There are a lot of great presentations. Sometimes there's not a lot, a, a chance to breathe. And what we really want to encourage people to do this year is breathe. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, take a walk, go grab somebody, go get some coffee. We've got more time for lunches. And then what we're also doing is, is, is we're really trying to do some fun stuff in the evenings and really hope that you all are able to join us and, and come out and be part of that. So tonight, for the first time, we're doing the Future Music Honors event, which we're incredibly proud of. We're honoring three um, categories uh, of, of individuals who have done exemplary work uh, over the lifetime of, of our organization, and we'll talk more about those honorees uh, throughout the day. But the honors event's going to be wonderful, and then uh, Wayne Kramer and, and his crew from Jelk at Our Doors are doing a late-night rock show uh, at the Hamilton, which we really hope you can come see. Um, yesterday, I ha had the opportunity um, to go to jail with Wayne Kramer and, and Jill Sobule, and went up to the the uh, Patuxent Correctional Facility up in Maryland to observe and, and be part of uh, the events that they do at Jail Cardar Doors, where they bring in instruments and, um, and sit down and talk and, and essentially do a mini workshop with, with people who have been incarcerated. And talk about, Wayne is able to talk about his personal story and, and the fact that he is someone who, who uh, is a felon, is an offender, and an ex-offender, and is also a musician, and talk about the, the transformative uh, role that music has played not only in his life but in the lives of others and the ability for music um, to be so key to expression and, and so, so central to speech. And then on the way back from, from that trip, which was obviously very moving and, and very complex and complicated, uh, you know, I got the news about Lou Reed. And, you know, for the last day or so, I've, I've been thinking back to those moments that in my life were very visceral uh, with, with Lou and his music. And the first time I heard Sweet Jane when I was 17 years old, and you know, the late nights when we would get out the guitars and, and, and see if we could get through the entirety of Sister Ray. Or the time I, you know, made one of my colleagues listen to Berlin on a cross-country uh, airplane trip because she hadn't heard it before. And all these moments, and, and what it really reinforced for me is, you know, really the reason we do this work here at Future Music is that, you know, everybody in this room has their own Lou Reed. You know, they have someone whose music has been central to the experiences that they have, and they can hear a song and they can be transported back into place, you know, in a moment. And it is so vitally important to think about music not just as entertainment or not just as something that is on the margins or not just a, you know, a widget where people can make money off of it. But music is central to who we are as individuals and, and who we are as people and, and it's so important, such an important part of our experience. And again, that's why we do this work and that's why you all come to this conference because it, it's really too important to not try to do this hard work. You know, we've said now for, for 13 years there's never going to be a five-point plan that's going to save the music industry. The issues are phenomenally complicated and difficult. This is a time of great uh, enthusiasm and excitement in many areas uh, for culture and for emerging business models 
and the fact we're going to get a thousand new non-commercial radio stations this year because of the passage of the low power radio legislation and there's a lot of stuff that we can celebrate and feel good about and there's a lot of stuff that is really 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 hard and we're going to talk about all that uh, over the next couple of days and, and a lot more so thank you uh, for for coming thank you to Georgetown University for being such a wonderful partner thank you to our sponsors and the people who help invest in the conference so it can actually take place and uh, we look forward to a lovely couple of days uh, now it's my pleasure and my honor to turn the stage over to our partner and co-founder at Future Music Coalition, Kristen Thompson. Good morning, everybody. Look at this, I have to have two laptops. Um, so my name is Kristen Thompson. I'm with Future of Music Coalition. I've been with FMC since it started. And, oh boy, this is what's changed my eyesight. Um, <laughs> so um, I thought we'd be start off the day with something fun, a pop quiz. So do you have your pencils? What? You don't? Well, um, so I have a question up here. A band with a new release is invited to play live on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. Are they paid for that? Now we have a very educated audience, so I have a sense that you know the answer. But here are some options that we give people. A, no, on, their only payment is the promotional benefit of playing the show. Yes, Jimmy Fallon pays, negotiates an appearance fee, just like any other gig. And the third one, yes, the band gets an appearance fee, as per the show's SAG after and AFM contracts, and residual payments each time the show re-airs. And the band's songwriters will also be paid performance royalties by their PRO, each time the show airs. So which answer is right? That's right, you guys are so smart. So yes, the answer is C. Um, that was one of the questions in the expert section of our music and money quizzes. Uh, a set of quizzes we've been running since June that use practical real world examples to test musicians' knowledge of copyright laws and the business practices that determine how money flows back to various rights holders. So the quizzes have been in the field for about 120 days, and we've had over 2,000 of them completed. And um, this has given us some interesting data to examine about quiz takers' understanding and their knowledge gaps. So for example, if we look at the results of the easy quiz, which uh, over 1,300 folks have completed, um, you can see the aggregate score, the average score for all folks is 67%. Uh, and unless we're grading on a serious curve, that is not an A. But here are, um, but you know, there are here are a couple of questions that survey takers found particularly difficult. Because there's some at the beginning of the quiz that lots of people got right. The really basic ones about, um, you know, do you, when, do you, when can you apply for copyright or when is something copyrighted and things like that. But here's a question that was tough for folks. We asked whether a band that's recording some new material decides to do a cover of the Rolling Stones song, Brown Sugar. So who did they need to get permission from before recording the cover? We gave them these options, which, you know, these all seem legit, right? The answers say half the folks thought they needed to get um, ad advance permission from Rolling Stones publisher. Um, and then 42% correct, correctly got it, that they don't need advance permission. What they do need, the US Copyright Act states that um, once a copyright owner has recorded and distributed a work publicly, a compulsory license, mechanical license is available to anyone else who wants to record and distribute the work in the US. As long as the artist doing the cover gets that license within 30 days of recording and then pays the mechanical license fees at the statutory compulsory rate. Lots of folks already know that in this room, but this was a tough question for people. Now, at least they got in the right category that they do need permission at some point, <laughs> or they do need to, to have some relationship with the existing song. Um, so there's that. Now, we had a, a question that was right after this one that said, OK, so they've recorded this brown sugar cover. They sell 500 uh, downloads of it, and they sell 500 vinyl copies of the record. So how much is that worth in mechanical royalties? And we gave them these options. And uh, let's hold on a second. We gave them these options. And here is what folks thought. About 
only about a quarter of respondents got um, the proper answer, which is $91. Lots of folks thought it was 9.1% of net sales, which is close. At least we're using the statute, we're using the numbers that are part of the <laughs> calculation for mechanical royalties for songs under five minutes. But you can see that what we see through these quizzes, and if I talked about all 38 or 40 questions, you would realize that there's a lack of awareness um, or a general confusion about the difference between the rights associated with musical compositions and sound recordings. But as many of you in this audience know, this is tough stuff, and it exposes some of the funny quirks and traits of copyright law, some of which are even quirkier and weirder um, as they've been forced to adapt to a digital music landscape that involves uses of compositions and sound recordings in ways that the original Copyright Act could never have imagined. And so a lot of them have been altered to sort of fit into these new categories. So cut folks some slack. These are some hard questions. And um, so let's look at the medium quiz. Whoop. So fewer folks have taken this uh, quiz, 374, but the average is actually lower at 862%. Um, and here's one of the questions that was particularly tough. Um, we asked if members of an orchestra get paid if they do a recent recording of a Stravinsky piece on a major label, and that, that is made available for sale on iTunes. This is not an uncommon instance, but the reason we asked this question was that orchest orchestras have a slightly different mechanism for payment. So we gave them these options 38% properly got that orchestra members who participated in the recording session are eligible for payments from the Sound Recording Special Payments Fund. Um, but, you know, all these other answers are kind of legit sounding, and so I can't, you know, there's possibility that makes sense, and some of them are just a little slightly confused by what Sound Exchange does versus iTunes sales, you know? So that is what happens. There's a bit of dispersion around that answer. With the hard quiz, we've had fewer completes or just fewer people taking it, but the average is a little bit better. Um, I, we asked, this one had a lot of folks, uh, it was a challenge for some people. We asked if there's a DJ that matches up big songs, yet recognizable songs that remain recognizable. Um, does he need permission from rights holders to perform these mixes live, like in a club? And we, no, actually, as long as the venue and the festival or the festival he's performing at have performance licenses from the PROs, that per, the performer doesn't need the permission. What is um, obvious is that a lot of folks thought, yes, he does need permission, but that would only take, that would only um, come into play if that was a sound recording of the mashups, which in that case, A would be correct. So. Less, oh, but you know, again, this is a subtle question, but one that's incre increasingly real as more DJs do performances in venues. So this happens a lot. So lest you think that this is some cruel exercise in asking musicians tricky questions about all the weirdo parts of the music industry and then pointing fingers at their wrong answers, I should note that taking the quiz itself is designed to be educational. Each quiz mark question is marked in real time, so as you take it, you know it, if, whether you got it right or wrong right away. And um, whether the person gets it right or wrong, we provide an explanation right below it, and then links to additional resources to you know, answer their questions or do follow-up. And then when you finish a quiz, you get a complete summary of all the answers you can keep if you want, and you also get a copy of your score. So um, the Money for Music quizzes are designed to educate musicians about the contours of copyright law and business practice in a fun way and give us, as advocates and educators, a sense of where the knowledge gaps are. We're happy to share the results with any advo advocacy groups or educators um, who want to better understand what trips up musicians. If you're designing courses or uh, seminars or panels, these might be helpful. We can also build um, custom quiz sets if you're an educator and you want to, to test your students' baseline knowledge, it's not hard for us to build it, and we put a little code at the front so you know who your students are, and then we can give you the results. So if you're interested in those things, just come talk to me in the next couple of days. 
And the quizzes are really just another thing that FMC has done over the years. It adds to the, the resources that we offer and continue to manage um, on our website that are uh, offered to edu educate and inform musicians. Um, in addition to FMC's blog and website and our social media and our research and the analyses we do, we offer um, lots of stuff that translates and distills these complex in issues. And for example, uh, for a number of years, we've kept this new business model spreadsheet available, which itemizes about 40 different, different models and if and how um, performers, copyright owners, publishers, and songwriters are paid through all the different channels. We have a digital distribution worksheet that shows how you get your music into these platforms and then how much it costs and all that stuff, the really basic stuff. And then over here, we did an infographic over the summer. Um, this is actually has a slightly different purpose, and it, it's um, sort of a, a materials that corrects the record, where there's misunderstandings about how the money flows, which can falsely influence readers' perceptions. So, for example, there's a common misunderstanding, there's a common conflation that Pandora and Spotify, about between the two, which makes readers think they operate under the same licensing framework because they're often referenced in the same news articles as, as, as like peers of each other. But I think folks in this room know they operate under different licensing frameworks and they are in fact quite different in how they pay rights holders. So this infographic tried to um, give a visualization of the differences, um, which is available online. And we also have a poster of it available at the front desk um, if you'd like to hang it on your wall, <laughs> which is it's sort of a par partially my own um, interest in like having a way to think about it um, on a really granular level. So we wanted to make sure we could underscore the differences. We also have our Artist Revenue Streams project, which for the past three years we've been examining how musicians' revenue streams are changing over time and why. Gene Cook will be up here in just a minute to talk a bit about some recent work we've been doing on that. but some stuff that's actually, in, in addition to the findings and the data memos we've been doing, the most popular item on the website is uh, the 42 Revenue Streams page, which lists off, it's a comprehensive list of all the ways that musicians can make money off their compositions, their performances, their sound recordings, their brand, or their knowledge of the craft. And in addition to 42 Streams, we have another version of it, same information, but organized into columns based on whether the revenue stream is existing, expanded, or new. So these things are um, part of what uh, FMC offers on a daily basis to make sure musicians can um, understand what's going on. And it's the core reason that we continue to organize events like this. Change is exciting, but it's also unsettling. And you can see that right in our, whoops, in our in our uh, mission statement, education, research, and advocacy, um, those aren't random words. We think that all three are critical to building a healthy music ecosystem. And FMC remains committed to distilling and translating these complex issues to make sure that musicians can make smart, informed decisions that make a vibrant music landscape possible. So thanks again for coming. And I'd like to invite Jean Cook up to talk a bit more about artist revenue streams.